Hello everyone and good morning. Welcome to the Buildings Pavilion at COP27. Welcome to everyone who's watching us online. My name is Mariana Castaño Cano. I am a climate communication expert and founder of 10 Billion Solutions. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator today for the central event at the Buildings Day at the Pavilion. This event is named Building Our Future, the potential of the buildings and the building materials for a climate neutral world. We all know we have a lot of homework to do back home for a climate neutral 2050, which is in terms of buildings and infrastructures around the corner. In 2020, the buildings and construction sector accounted for 36% of the global final energy consumption and 37 on a, of the energy related CO2 emissions. And these are fresh data from the global ABC, the UNEP report. The challenges are high. Reaching net zero energy efficient and resilient buildings and construction will require everyone's on board. We are talking here about changing the way we design, the way we build, and of course, the way we use our buildings and appliances. We have today an amazing panel of speakers. We have people joining online and people here with us in Shamershade. It is my pleasure to first describe who will be with us um, in the panel because some of them will have to leave because they have other commitments. Um, we have uh, Vera Rodenhoff, who's head of the strategic issues of international cooperation on climate and energy and implementing initiatives at the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. We have uh, Jonathan Duin, who is the head interim chef of the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction hosted by UNEP. We have Anna Dyson, Heinz Professor at the Yale CEA, and they will present together with Leon Diaz Bone, Chief Secretary General Office at ICLE, a very interesting study on the status and solutions of buildings materials. And we have online Dr. Naomi Kina, Assistant Professor at McGill University, Dr. Mai Ling Loco, Assistant Professor at YSOA. Dr. Mohamed Ali Etnan is with us here today from Yale. Dr. Dirk Messner, President of the German Environment Agency, is here with us. We have Professor Dr. Philipp Miselwitz connecting online. He is the Executive Director of Bauhaus Earth. And we will have Sharon Springs, the CEO of Grace Farms Foundation, also connecting online because we could unfortunately join in person. And at the end, we have um, a representative from the World Green Buildings Council to close this event. And without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Vera Rodenhoff from the Liem Lika to give deliver, delivering our, uh, the first remarks at this event. Vera, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and open a bit louder and open this event. Um, it's often said that buildings are the sleeping giants uh, in the energy sector, and I think that's true. And I, I also like the picture that gives us. And I think we really we have to wake up the sleeping giant. Uh, so we all need to what know what we need to do to keep 1.5 degrees centigrade, and not only is it within reach, but still try to reach them, and we know that the building sector is responsible for around uh, one third of energy related emissions uh, and as well as uh, one third of the global energy use. Uh, this sector offers great benefits in terms of living and in terms of saving not just money but also energy and that's especially in the energy crisis we are facing today. Uh, this is a potential we really need to tap, not just the energy crisis, all the other crises like climate as well. So uh, I'm therefore happy and proud that we can say that Germany for a very long time has been engaged in the energy buildings and energy efficiency sector. Uh, we've been a member of, of uh, the global ABC for quite a while, since 2020, um, and we're contributing to that work uh, through in-kind contributions to the IZ, but also, uh, and, and much of our time, uh, and the contribution of 400,000 euros for the global ABC for the next two years. 
Um, we are also very active in the building sector in many other uh, aspects. Uh, I'll highlight the program uh, PEEP, Program on Energy Efficiency in Buildings, uh, which we uh, launched together uh, with France uh, and the GIZ and the ASD. Um, and this is actually a, a baby or a spin-off of the Global ABC. I think it's the only Global ABC initiative that is there is so far. I think there should be more. But um, I think PEEP is pretty big to carry the load. And uh, it has already developed a pipeline of 3 billion euros worth of building projects to reduce energy use and incre increase resilience. And uh, I'm very happy that PEEP Cool will be launched now and enlarged. So PEEP will be enlarged and uh, PEEP Cool will be launched in 11 countries now and uh, with a contribution of the Green, Green Climate Fund uh, of 220 million of funding and uh, I think that's zero and also five million extra from Germany and uh, there is also a su substantial contribution from France on top of that. Uh, so in addition to that, so that can go a long way in terms of facilitating learning and bringing the building sector and standard setting and implementing what the ABC actually does. In addition, we finance research to bring forward decarbonization in the building sector and uh, two exciting studies will be presented today. So I'm really looking forward, uh, as long as I'm still here, to seeing and hearing about them. Both studies highlight the importance of addressing embodied carbon and the practical steps that we have to take to address it. So these are science-based policy recommendations, and we like to base what we do on science. So also an important thing to say at this COP. Um, studies explore the application in different geographies and contexts such as the urban one. Pioneers have developed the studies, and now we need engagement from the national sector, the subnational sector, scientists, and the private sector to scale them up. We need to work together to share the knowledge and innovations in order to achieve what we know that we have to do. And much more work is going on here, and I'd just like to highlight um, that there is also a building breakthrough in the making, which France has pioneered and uh, there will be a call for action to launch a building breakthrough, this breakthrough later today, and Germany is a proud participant of that as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm looking forward to uh, the presentations of the studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. Yes, this uh, week we've seen uh, a lot of good news concerning buildings and construction. So. Yesterday, I don't know if you checked on the global status uh, report, we are off track, right? But there are some aspects of the homework we must do that are not looking bad. And uh, from the energy efficient side, I must say uh, the news are good and I hope that from the embodied carbon side also, uh, the, the, the news will be good as well. And we will learn a little bit more. But before, we want to continue having the wider picture of what is the situation and nothing uh, else could give us that photo finish better than the Global ABC. And we have Jonathan Duane from the Global ABC to give us that perspective. Jonathan, please. Thank you, Mariana. Um, yeah, so just, I think we've heard already today, yesterday, and also Mariana mentioned it, the building sector is not on track and the emissions are important. However, I would say even if we see that there's been quite a bit of progress on the energy efficiency aspects, um, as you can see, most NDCs of countries mention energy efficiency, energy efficiency in buildings, building energy codes. However, the issue related to materials for the moment has been overlooked, I would say, or you know, some people have had interest in it for quite some time, but uh, the focus has always been on operational energy. And what we are trying to promote is to have a, what we would call a whole life carbon approach, where you look both at the issues related to, of course, the operational energy, but also specifically also looking at the embodied carbon uh, and embodied energy of the building. Um, I mean, globally, the numbers, and numbers unfortunately are not exact, but it says about one third of, I mean, a little bit more than I would say a third of the emissions from a building are coming from the material side. 
let's say 10%. Even though I would say that's not really reflecting the reality because if you go to different countries, actually you might have very different numbers. Um, I was in India a few weeks ago and uh, there it was mentioned that it was minimum 20%. And then of course, if you look at different housing or building typologies, it even changes because if you go to the residential sector, it can be up to 60%. So it's actually a very important element uh, to, to, to address today and to look more attentively at this question of uh, the materials. So the choice of materials overall is very important, not only, I would say, in terms of looking at the embodied carbon, but also looking at the operational carbon. Of course, you make different choices that can be better. Maybe they have a higher embodied carbon, but might have more benefic benefits on the operational carbon of a building. So it's really important to have this holistic picture about the building. As we know, actually, the consumption of resources and the consumption of materials is going to increase drastically. We know that there are still a lot of buildings that are need to be constructed, especially if we look at Asia and if we look at Africa, where you know a lot of the construction needs still needs to happen. And um, looking at, I think the OECD mentioned that, you know, actually the amount of uh, materials will triple uh, by 2060 that are used in the building sector or overall, but the building sector being like one third or the construction sector overall, I would say, being one third of those uh, materials and resources. Um, about two years ago, or even a little bit more, but uh, the International Resource Panel actually issued a report that was called uh, Resource Efficiency and Climate Change. Um, and that was actually to make the link between this issue of the materials and what is really the impact related to climate change. And in this context, um, it was actually showed that material efficiency strategies can have a very important uh, benefit for reducing carbon emissions overall. It is said that it's, you know, in speci specifically looking at the residential sector, for example, uh, in, I would say, in G7 countries, it's about 80 to 100% of actually the greenhouse gas emissions from the life cycle that could be reduced through that process. However, it's not that easy, um, especially that because that means transforming also the supply chains. And so it goes beyond, I would say, only, I would say, the architects and the building. It goes all the way to the production of materials. And how can we start influencing that process is, I think, one of the next important challenges that we need to um, take on board. I mean, there, is, there are some steps in the direction. I would say that I see that there's a lot of recognition currently about the issue of embodied carbon and materials. There is more and more interest. In many of the African countries, actually, that's one of the areas where people want to work on, and especially looking at how can we bring more mat alternative materials, or I would say even some vernacular materials that can be made more sexy again, I would say. Um, so there is quite a bit of opportunity I think, to, to work on the topic and to engage with governments and stakeholders. But of course, it requires all the stakeholders to join forces and work together, have a very clear vision about where we want to go and what our targets are. Um, we are under the Global Alliance for Building and Construction. We have currently set up a working group specifically on materials. So it's also an area that we are now going to give way more attention to. And as mentioned earlier, Germany has funded a study that we will hear more about uh, later by one of the panel members, one of the presenters, sorry. But uh, actually a study to see what is the status currently with materials uh, and you know, talking about building materials and the climate and what are the solutions or what are the priorities or how can we actually tackle the issue. Even of course, if tackling the issue will be very different in Europe again or in the US, than if we go to Burkina Faso, for example. And so it's very important to always keep that in mind that you know, I think the steps and the actions uh, are different and we need to be able to adapt to that. Um, in addition, also what I want to mention is that uh, in UNEP, we have managed another program that's called the One Planet Network and which is a 10-year framework program on sustainable consumption and production. 
and that one specifically has been looking at SDG 12, uh, consumption and production, same consumption and production. And there we have been working uh, to some extent on the issues of circularity and materials. And uh, this, this work will continue now under the Global ABC Materials Group specifically. And we will be contributing to uh, the strategy uh, that actually was established for SDG 12 that has been extended to 2030. So there, there will be a close link to the issue specifically looking at yeah, resource consumption, resource efficiency in the building and construction sector. And I think I will stop here because otherwise I, I will never stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was very clear. And the, the, the colleagues and friends uh, only have to flash the QR codes that they have all around this beautiful pavilion. And they can find more about uh, the, the latest report from the Global ABC. And uh, we all know here we work e or we are uh, close to the buildings uh, and construction sector. We know that half of what will be standing in only 30 years has to be built. And any climate action, we hear this all the time, must be built on solid foundations. Science must provide the solid foundation on any climate action. And this includes buildings. So that half of the built environment to be built yet by 2050 must be built on the strong and wide shoulders of the science. And we have here a representative from Yale and Anna Dyson is going to introduce us to the findings of a recent study, Building Materials and Climate, Status and Solutions. Anna, please. Thank you so much uh, for coming. I am extremely honored to represent our team here. Uh, we have a we have a large team uh, that spans six continents, uh, looking at the challenge of building materials in the climate. I'm uh, represented here today with uh, my colleagues who are co-leading the study, Dr. Mailing Loco from Ghana is leading the West African uh, spotlight. Dr. Mohamed Ali Atman, who will be joining our panel today, uh, is leading the, is co-leading the India study, and Dr. Mo, uh, Naomi Kina is leading the North and, and South America uh, circular material economy study. So we're a large group of architects, engineers, scientists, and industry professionals who are looking at how we can really rethink building materials and the climate based on a wealth of practices that we've accumulated over thousands of years. Um, and it's true that our approach and our report will focus a lot on the science. But I think it's really important also to say that building materials are not just about so-called embodied energy, that is all of the energy that we um, expend uh, to extract, produce, transport, and implement built building materials on site, or about the operational um, energy or carbon, if you will, um, if it's a fossil-based uh, energy that is used to drive building systems for heating, cooling, lighting, and, and other plug loads. But it's also about the impact that our material use has on regional ecosystems and on urban heat island effects and other ancillary 
cost of materials, the way that we metabolize materials um, globally and locally has extended impacts uh, on global health of living systems, including and especially human systems. So we are going to be looking at this from the standpoint of a whole building life cycle. But first, let's look at how and where we're using materials today. Today, as we can see from this chart, the preponderance of our building materials are coming from extracted mineral-based materials, concrete, steel, brick, and aluminum. And they constitute the vast majority of the carbon footprint of the building, the global building um, sector as a whole. However, and we can see here in 2015, it's tempting to think that this is how we always have to build and how we always have built. But if we look at this chart from 1945, this is post-World War II, we can see that the preponderance of our global material flows were actually bio-based. We had a small fraction. We managed to build very large global cities with bio-based and earth-based material processes. And how did we do that? Over the, across the world, the preponderance of the materials, as our illustrious panel from this morning pointed out, came from local sources of earth and bio-based materials. And we can see that they were very much adapted to local bioclimates. We can see here we have a, a, a hybrid, hot, humid, hot, arid climate on the right. And on the left, we have a, a hot, humid climate. We can see they're not the same shapes, they're not the same forms, and they're not the same materials. Um, here we can see on the right-hand side how materials were formed in order to actually respond, even within one day, a change in wind uh, uh, patterns and slight changes in humidity. Tremendous knowledge, embodied knowledge, let's say, that we had for centuries that we have largely forgotten about in uh, the 20th century in our so-called advanced systems, our scientific or advanced engineering systems. And we're not advocating necessarily a back to the future. We're not saying, let's go back to the way we built 100 years ago, because we know that the, with the global population and market pressures, we need advanced materials and we need scientific-based advanced processes. However, we must combine with going back to the fact that we need to tailor our materials if we're going to get to so-called on-site net zero energy, or let's say net zero energy in water, because we always have to look at the energy water nexus in our material production, extraction, and maintenance then we really do need to start to look at a tailored on-site local solution to our buildings. And we do need to start to shift back towards bio-based and biocompatible processes as much as we can, while maintaining the health of regional and global ecosystems and forests and agricultural lands. So just looking at what we do with energy and let's say the carbon footprint, what we're looking at if we are largely a fossil-based energy economy, which unfortunately we still are, but we are going to shift towards renewables, um, we look at the embodied carbon um, of materials and we look at operational carbon emissions. This is really the material carbon emissions will have, as we said, all of the process-based emissions. And then ultimately it leads towards what we call a carbon use intensity, which we can measure in our buildings over time and over the course of a life cycle. This is a chart to illustrate what Jonathan was talking about, which is that as we start to decarbonize our grid over time, as we get better numbers in terms of the way that we are um, operating, and as we get better practices for operational energy, that is, we're going to decarbonize as much as we can our heating, cooling, lighting, and plug load systems, we can see here that in the light green, the embodied carbon of materials has starts to take on greater and greater significance proportionally uh, to the building life cycle over time. This chart shows in the uh, light blue operational carbon with a standard performance building, but in the dark blue we can see that we are largely starting to decarbonize. Uh, as um, our uh, prior speakers have said, we have some good news on the operational front. Um, but let's take a look at materials. And I apologize, this is a little bit washed out this slide, but we can see if we were going to go all the way to the top of this chart that primary concrete is the preponderance of the bulk of the building materials that we use. 
um, we can see that only a fraction of that um, uh, is uh, recycled, uh, less than 10%. Um, when we look at the metals, uh, like steel and aluminum, of course we know that they can recycle very nicely, but what is the proportion? It's very small steel. Why? Because we have a growing gap between the demand and the supply of recycled aluminum and steel. So we don't have as good a story as people will tell you. We need to do better in our design for disassembly and reassembly of these systems. Uh, now if we start going towards the bottom of the chart, and on the left-hand side you see 2020, where we are today, we have a tiny fraction of materials that we use in the bio cat uh, categories, even timber. Timber, you would think that would be much uh, larger, as I showed you from our graph from 1945, it was the preponderance of material flows were bio-based. Today it's very small, um, but we could, if we were to sustainably manage wood, timber, bamboo, agricultural waste, mycelium, and living biomass, they should, by 2060, really rise to be about half of our material sector. Then, the preponderance of our non-renewable sectors need to start to participate in what we would call a circular material economy. That means that we need to try as hard as we can throughout the life cycle to design out the waste, meaning we're going to design for reuse, reuse of materials, and then if we cannot reuse, we will recycle. Of course, as we can see on this chart, everything um, that is not, uh, we're still going to be uh, using a lot of materials, uh, sorry, a lot of primary based materials um, in 2060. We're still going to be producing, so we have to figure out how to de decarbonize the production and the gestation of materials. Now, how do we do that? We're looking at really exemplifying within the built environment sector exactly what the Secretary General told us at the beginning of this conference, that if we do not cooperate, we will not reach our goals. Nothing could be more true um, about that statement than the built environment sector, where we must look at the production, construction, use, and end of life, or we would say end of use, because we don't want to take them out of their life cycle. Um, and through research, policy, and finance, we must simultaneously incentivize the stakeholders across that life cycle to cooperate and to be equally responsible. We need a level playing field. We have to close the carbon loophole in the built environment sector. We cannot penalize countries that are producing and under tremendous amount of pressure to produce uh, at a very, very low cost. Uh, we must be shouldering the responsibility. We cannot have um, a, either um, uh, a taxation for, for um, reducing costs and reducing environmental regulations, and that also includes human beings in the process. If we're going to have sustainable ecologies, human beings are the living systems within those ecologies, so we must also couple fair labor practices with fair environmental practices and support those countries in order to get fair prices for those practices. So, as Jonathan said, we are looking at a, a framework to look at avoiding, shifting, improving, and adapting the built environment sector for materials. And when we say avoid, we're saying design better with less. We're not saying do without. This is a very, very important uh, distinction. A lot of people, when they hear saying build less or build with less, we're not actually saying that because I don't think that it's in any way viable or fair to emerging economies to say, you should stop building after, we, after many advanced economies have built up. What we're saying is build better, decarbonize, and we can, then the global south and emerging economies will show the rest of the world the way, and they can leapfrog in many sectors, as we'll see in a minute. We, we're gonna shift uh, to the uh, use of alternative materials. We have to improve our decarbonization of conventional materials, and of course, adapt to reduce operational carbon in general. One of the most important um, uh, aspects of our report that we're gonna focus on is it's very difficult actually to transition from a linear to a circular material economy in construction. There's a lot of lip service that gets, that's given to it, but it is not an easy thing, and that's why we need the cooperation. Um, we need to basically look at how energy, water, and primary materials will, instead of being the primary producers in the built environment sector, because it's be by far the largest sector towards emissions, wastewater, and uh, construction waste, we're looking at keeping those secondary materials in the system and also even with on-site uh, zero and district zero, 
sustainable means keeping energy and water into the system through renewable means. One important thing that I also think we need to focus on here is that the more we build, the more materials we have in the built environment sector. So we have a lot of those materials, especially in the global north and in um, uh, evolved economies that have really a lot of mid 20th century failing structures that they could be recuperating and reusing. We can start thinking about materials, uh, uh, buildings not for demolition and, and landfill, but as material banks. But one very important thing about that is at end of use, um, we need to very much prioritize the re adaptive reuse of buildings themselves. That means our first, um, all of our first choices are on the right-hand side of this graph, meaning that um, we, want to, um, uh, we, we want to reuse our buildings. If we can't reuse our buildings, we will reuse the components. If we cannot reuse the components, then we will reuse the materials. And as a last resort, we will recycle. So recycling is a buzz term, but that would be our last resort in a circular material economy. Why? Because it's very chemically and energetically expensive. So we don't necessarily want to do that. We want to keep things in place if we can. How do we keep things in place? All the way back to the design phase. We have to design for disassembly and reassembly and, and, and reuse as much as possible. So a quick snapshot, and then I'll um, pass the baton to my colleagues. Um, in the different sectors, um, Cement in the concrete sector is by far um, the contributor towards the carbon footprint of the concrete and cement uh, sector. But as we know, concrete is extremely valuable to us. It's, it is durable. Um, it's, it, um, it gives a great amount of structure uh, for the price point, and um, it's not going away. So we need to reinvent cement, and it can be reinvented through a number of different strategies. Um, we have to over, uh, avoid the material overuse by optimizing design. That means digi digitalizing the process as much as possible through computer-aided processes. We'll adapt carbon capture and storage at plant, but also potentially um, re-inserting um, that carbon back into the production of concrete itself in order to increase the strength of, of concrete. And of course, as I said, we want to adapt with as much bio-based content and of secondary materials as possible. Steel is the next largest emitter, uh, carbon emitter in the built environment. And in ste with steel, um, really we need to improve the quality and collection of scrap because steel can be very nicely recycled if we, uh, or reused, components reused. This is a good example of this building we're in right now um, of lots of recycled aluminum and steel or reused um, that we can design for disassembly and reassembly very quickly in all of our buildings. Um, we need to shift the production to renewable electric energy. That means we need to electrify the process and, and, and use best available technologies. We need to adapt um, the design of materials uh, with the entire bu uh, building life cycle in mind. Um, aluminum is a growing uh, area. Um, we use aluminum. We're increasingly replacing steel with aluminum on building curtain walls and facades. We need to dramatically improve the recycling rate per the initials chart that still shows only a fraction of recycled aluminum because we need to uh, adapt the design of alloys with aluminum alloys with recycling in mind. And we really need to shuff, shift production again to renewable electrical energy sources. All of these materials, concrete, steel, and aluminum, really depend on a clean grid mix. We will not decarbonize without the grid. Um, in fossil-based plastics and polymer composites, this is also a dramatically growing area. We can see it all around us. There's probably not one single surface in this building right now that doesn't have a plastic surface on it, and we can smell it. So um, this is a big issue for health and well-being. Uh, we need to dramatically reduce and shift uh, the off-gassing of emissions in the production of plastics and also in the implementation. Uh, I feel obligated to say that as we sit here. We might have a few headaches in the room by the end of the day. Um, but we also need to adapt towards greater and greater bio-based feedstocks. We're not quite there. We need to collect, uh, improve collection and sorting. But with bio-based plastics, like with all the material sectors, we really need to improve the energy, sorry, the research and development uh, towards the um, uh, circular adoption of aquaculture waste um, from, um, and also agricultural waste towards bioplastics. Uh, so we can partner with uh, uh, the agricultural industries in, 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 in this way. Glass is a very, very important material for the future. It definitely gets a hugely bad rap, um, a deserved bad rap around the world because we've replaced in many areas commercial building stock uh, from sustainable local uh, uh, earthen and biomaterials towards a lot of glass and steel. 
on the facade. So glass has in many areas, especially in those cooling degree climates like the one we're in here in Egypt, it has dramatically uh, driven up the cooling requirements and loads of buildings. However, and this is a big however, glass is very important towards future on-site net zero because it may be the material that we need in order to maximally absorb, capture, so capture, store, and redistribute solar energy for internal building loads. So we need glass, but we need to adapt glass not to reflect energy and waste the energy, but to take it into the system. So uh, we need to very much uh, shift the, towards the electrification and shifting to best available technologies, improve incentives for local production and recycling, very important glass. We can re recycle, it's one of the best materials for recycling, but we also need to adapt um, uh, renovation and demolition practices to maintain the quality. It's fragile. Uh, easily uh, curtain wall systems and glass systems can be uh, destroyed um, in that process and we need to both design for demolition in mind so that it can be reused. Um, and finally, oh my goodness, sorry, oh, my. okay, <laughs> finally, we need to ramp back up. If this is the back to the future moment. We need to go back also to abundant earth materials like masonry and earth-based we need to adapt standards for earth-based materials. In Africa, we have the, some of the most beautiful um, uh, uh, global heritage architecture that is earth-based. And we must learn from the past to go back to these very sustainable methods where they are biodegradable and they are, can be a great part of the circular material economy. But we need the standards because they're not regular. If the more bio uh, material you have in earth and material, it can be very much dependent on the local um, geology um, and uh, earth conditions, so standards are critical, um, but we can improve um, in, in so many different ways. We also need to shift so social material acceptance. Sadly, uh, there is a premium on so-called modern buildings uh, the, around the globe to show that we're modern. And so a lot of times um, in um, regional um, uh, economies that have an, a wonderful tradition of earth and base materials, it gets rejected because it's not the image that a lot of um, companies maybe or, or um, uh, buildings want to project. So that is a challenge that we have. It's also a challenge with timber and wood. Um, we need to shift the social acceptance towards um, understanding that this is a material that can last a very long time. Actually, where we're from at Yale, the preponderance of the building stock is in wood and it's lasted for four or five centuries. We have many old houses that are already more than 400 years old, but they're maintained over time, so they stay in place. Uh, we have to improve the material recovery of timber base, and we very much, per what we're smelling today again, we need to avoid petrochemical-based blues, chemicals, and coatings that are terrible for health and well-being, terrible for the ecosystem, and also reduce um, the circularity of these systems, our ability to recycle them um, into new uh, uh, material economies. Um, this is just a quick uh, summary uh, uh, snapshot. Um, if you see the business as usual, <laughs> um, if we, even if we adopted all of our best practices and all of our, um, uh, uh, you know, the things that are happening right now with the decarbonization of materials, we will still dr substantially increase in the carbon emissions by 2060 um, if we're business as usual. So if we adopt all of the different um, whole building life cycle from production to, to uh, dis um, design, distribution, and implementation and end of life, we can dramatically decarbonize all of these sectors. But we must shift over towards the bio base. And I know that I'm out of time, so, but oh, I didn't want to. And la lastly, I just want to emphasize that we need to also go back to uh, designing through ma nature-based processes. We need to start thinking about biomass materials as a material. That means living systems are materials that we will um, uh, uh, design our cities with and we will cover surfaces with. Um, and we will be part, once again, of the kind of bio-based pathway uh, as opposed to the mineral-based pathway, which as we see is only part of our recent history. Only the last hundred years did we start really ramping up in mineral-based processes. The, the preponderance of human um, history and, and civilization has been compatible with bio-based processes. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. I have the feeling I am stepping out of a uh, master in the, at the Yale Center for Ecosystem in Architecture. Thank you so much, Anna, for what you do. Thank you for distilling so much work and congratulations to the 
uh, professors who, who are probably watching us online and who also contributed to this study, which is really an in-depth X-ray the, of the current situation of uh, how do we build our buildings and what uh, we must change. And if you want to touch some of the bioplastic uh, that Anna was mentioning, there are a few uh, solutions uh, um, at the uh, Solar Impulse uh, Exhibition Corner, so you can touch how it feels, for example, recycled from agricultural waste plastic. So I invite you to, after this event, go and have a look. Thank you, Anna. And now we continue with our presentation and we move on to our colleague from ICLE. ICLE, as you may know, is the constituency at the UNFCCC that represents the, the cities and uh, the local governments. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to Leon diaz -Bone who is going to present the findings of a very interesting study about the greenhouse gas reduction potential in the urban construction sector. Leon, please. Could I have uh, my slides, please? Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to present some findings of our study on uh, climate urban oriented cli climate oriented urban development, uh, which specifically looks at uh, greenhouse gas reduction potentials and synergetic fields of action in cities. Uh, this study is uh, funded by the German government through the German Environment Agency and conducted in partnership um, between ICLE, uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and the Austrian Environment Agency. Um, the study f covers three synergetic areas of action, which are um, sustainable buildings, urban transport, and redensification. But uh, for today's session, we'll only focus on the findings on, of the construction um, sector. Um, and um, OK, I think there was a small mistake. But I think we've heard plenty today already about the urgent need for a transformation in the building sector. Um, so I, I would maybe then rather skip that. But um, I think maybe what, what, what is important to consider is that when we are on the urban level, we are also having the challenge of data availability. And this is precisely one of the framework conditions that this uh, study seeks to operate in, how to challenge these heterogeneous levels of data availability. Um, that w and how it can be used to still generate insights that can be of use to local governments. Um, for the scope of this project, um, we selected six cities in three countries, Germany, India, and the Philippines, who um, uh, have different uh, growth rates and also different urban structures, just to um, generate some insights. We have um, Leipzig and Essen in Germany, we have uh, Santa Rosa and Pasig in the Philippines, and we have Nagpur and Rajkot in India. Um, and we were, um, we were looking to apply two different scenarios as a what-if analysis. So. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, so um, one of the scenarios is in the what-if analysis is what if 5% um, of the existing building stock would, uh, or there would be a 5% increase in, in wood uh, in, in the building materials of the existing buildings and the other scenario is a 15% increase. Right. Um, as I mentioned, we are dealing with the challenge of uh, very heterogeneous uh, levels of data availability, so we had to develop a different approach for each of the different contexts. In the case of Germany, we have relatively good data availability. There are some differences between West and Eastern Germany, which is, of course, from the period when a lot of the existing building stuff is still uh, constructed. So we used um, yeah, the different building typologies to actually assess um, the modeling. Um, in the Philippines, we use the derivation of the building stock. In the Philippines, we use the deviation of the building stock and use via the floor area and the average materials used. 
and in India we had to do employ a top-down model for the extrapolation of economic and material growth data. Um, when it comes to the results, we um, I hope it's legible in the room, but um, you can basically see that uh, when it comes to a 5% uh, increase in, in the use of wood, we would have a reduction between 1.5 and 3% in the different cities, and with the 15% increase, we would actually go to um, yeah, a savings range between 5 and 10%. Okay, uh, even louder. Okay, so for me it's loud, but okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to not to shout, though. Um, yeah, so um, when the with the reduction potentials, um, we see that they're de dependent on the materials that are predominantly have been used in the existing building stock, which of course varies greatly across contexts. But uh, at least with all methodological approaches, we were able to deliver plausible results on a similar uh, GHG range. Yeah, um, when it comes to the conclusions, um, I'll just filter a few of them. So especially for Germany, um, we're seeing that with the Ukraine war, um, the current ma market situation for wood is rather pro problematic and it does not really favor the substitution of concrete and metal through wood. Um, and we also see that the accounting of gray and embedded emissions in the construction sector is crucial to obtain an accurate picture of externalities um, as embodied emissions in buildings currently make up roughly half. Um, and we see that local public procurement is a key level for cities, and that but the lo local municipalities are having the challenge that the, the tendering processes need to be adapted accordingly. Um, and that is maybe then also a task for the national level, that uh, the material neutral tendering and the construction sector uh, should be adapted further, um, which then needs to be in line with federal regulation. Um, and another challenge that I've, we have identified is that um, we actually need to. No? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so we see that there's then also a need towards addressing professional communities that in the teaching and the design of buildings that we actually need to have a, a mind shift there, then that there's actually a proactive approach of integrating more creative solution when it comes to these materials um, so that not everyone is planning their buildings just by the default scheme that they normally apply. Um, yeah, um, now it's working again, thank you. Yeah, um, however, uh, in general, we find that more research is needed to elaborate consumption-based carbon accounting and to make it also more feasible for practitioners to strengthen the policy information and we need further studies dedicated to investigating sector and spatial trade-offs as well as to better understand supply and demand and the LCA perspective for buildings needs to be further strengthened. Um, overall, so that comes back then again to the global study that has three sectors. We find that the building sector has the highest saving potentials of all the three fields of action required and um, yeah, the result is then that the increased demand for wood and construction would need to be supported by a strong legislative legislative, sorry, and political commitment to sustainable forest management. Um, again, this is just an excerpt of the study, um, but you can find more information and, and details on the methodology in a forthcoming uh, journal article that is then published by the team. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Th thank you very much, Leon. Uh, thank you. All the presentations uh, from Anna and Leon will be available. Uh, on the UN, uh, on the globalabc.org uh, website. It's, it's a lot of information, super interesting, so we bring that back home with us. Uh, and now we are going to proceed to our panel discussions, and we have uh, most of our next speakers connecting online, so I will invite the technical colleg colleagues to put them up on the screen. So we have uh, Dr. Naomi Kina from McGill University, Dr. Mylin Loco, assistant professor at the Jail School of Architects, uh, Dr. Mohamed Ali Etman is with us here, so Mohamed, please take your seat. And Professor Dirk Messner, also we have the chance um, of having him here with us um, from the German Environmental Agency. Uh, Dr. Philipp uh, Misselwitz, he's connected. Uh, hello, Philipp. And um, Sharon Prince is also connected online from the Grace Farms Foundation. Hello, Sharon. Hope all is good. 
And um, now we are going to proceed to the panel discussions. We are running a little bit uh, short of time, so we are going to accelerate. And I will kindly ask you to give a short answer so that all the speakers have a chance to touch upon all the different issues. And uh, I'm going to start, we heard a lot about the study from the jail um, Center for Ecosystem uh, in Architecture. And I, I would like now to, to, uh, to ask uh, uh, Mai, Mai Ling, uh, also from the Yale School of Architecture, what are some of the most promising ways in which the emerging economies might lead the global transition to low carbon building materials? Because as uh, Jonathan said, uh, we have 197 countries represented here at the COP, and we have 197 realities also when it comes to buildings. So Mai Ling, may I? Yes, please, the floor is yours, Mai Ling. Thank you, and good morning, I guess, everyone. Uh, good afternoon there. Um, I think, you know, given the existing housing deficits that we see today and the projected need for future housing, this can seem quite daunting, but we can also see that as a tremendous opportunity to really expand economic activity and create millions of jobs in the process of decarbonization, uh, decarbonizing our building sector. Um, one of the largest se uh, material sectors that Anna just showed earlier is that of the concrete, right? And the use of cement, ordinary Portland cement. And there's a vast opportunity to green cement to really reinvent that. I think the idea of coupling urban um, growth with sort of rural industry um, in the generation of this whole new stream of bio-based materials is a really exciting opportunity. So that coupling is incredibly important. I think concrete masonry can lead the way also in also expanding opportunities for agricultural enterprises to play a much larger role in the improvement of high quality earth-based masonry. And lastly, as we've seen, you know, seeing the pressures on our sort of forests, our natural forests all over the world that are vital carbon sinks and that to a large extent um, impact tropical ecosystems to a disproportionate degree, that we can take pressure off of our timber industries by really making our plantations, our timber plantations much more effective and efficient and allowing other types of really fast growing non-timber biomass to play a much larger role. Um, particularly with bioinsulation in the global north, as well as all of these other materials like bamboo that can play a huge role in structural um, sort of building applications. So those are some uh, sort of promising um, avenues, all of which require the participation of bio-based building materials in our existing mineral-based economy today. Thank you very much, Mai. Thanks a lot. Now I would like to turn to Naomi. Uh, Anna mentioned um, just a few minutes ago that we need to make nature-based material sexy somehow, if you <laughs> allow me. Because we have this uh, image of progress equal glass and concrete, right? And, and then we don't care where all that waste difficult to recycle or impossible to recycle goes after. How do we make waste from construction something from the past? In, 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 a sh in a nutshell, uh, because I know there are also a lot of differences with, uh, regarding the geographical uh, situation, but how do we move further into uh, achieving a circular approach to buildings in that sense? Great, thank you so much, Mariana, and hello to everyone there. Um, so it's a great question. And I think, you know, globally, approximately 100 billion tons of construction, renovation and demolition waste is generated annually. And that's a lot of materials. And, you know, so there's huge potential to untap that and potentially, you know, reuse them and recycle them in new buildings, as Anna mentioned. Um, conventional construction is entrenched in a linear economy of take, make, waste. So it's really imperative that if we're going to lower greenhouse gas emissions in the construction sector now and in the future, that we figure out how to include these secondary materials in our renovation of buildings and in the construction of new buildings. And if we do that, there's significant potential for carbon savings, but there's also economic savings because in terms of reducing costs accrued by cities and municipalities and dealing with landfill and waste diversion. 
And this is where a circular economy approach can really hold promise because it strives to improve the resource efficiency by closing the resource loop and stopping the wasteful use of resources. And within the building sector, this involves reducing the use of virgin raw materials and the extraction of virgin raw materials at the manufacturing phase and really substituting the materials of this phase with second or third um, life cycle uh, materials. And this can consequently really eliminate CRD waste at the end of use phase. And two key circular economy strategies that we heard about today that can help that are reuse and recycling. And these offer one pathway towards really low carbon circular um, production and consumption of building materials. But another key aspect is that it's not just the end of use phase. Upstream design choices such as material selection or construction assembly design impact the viability of these low carbon end of use strategies such as reuse later in the life cycle of the building. So there's great opportunities to reduce carbon and to um, allow for, um, you know, re reduce carbon at the early stages of design. So there's a potential to reduce and avoid body carbon during the planning and design phases and really considering the end of use phase during the initial design phases to result in avoidance of waste and associated carbon emissions later in the building life cycle. Um, and as Anna mentioned, it's important to in, in look at um, potentially uh, really a, a strategies such as design for disassembly, which can help us kind of prize the material apart um, at that end of use phase, but also they retain the value of the original materials so that they can be reused. Thank you, Naomi. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I interrupted you. Th that's you okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, what you were just saying, remind me of those pictures that uh, Anna shows of wind towers. I think that is the name in the Middle East. We see that a lot. We also see here beautiful pictures of shading, which is okay. Uh, it's not reinventing uh, skyrocketing science, right? Shading is a, is a great way of avoiding mechanical uh, ventilation and cooling in houses. Mohammed from the Yale um, uh, School of, of Architecture and the Center for e Ecosystems in Architecture. I guess that you concentrate a lot on finding these upstream solutions, right? Avoiding waste, waste through better design. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say welcome to Egypt, since I'm the only Egyptian on the panel today, uh, this time. Uh, this is better. Can you hear me better? Yeah, great. Uh, um, so I wanted, like, in the context of the urbanization process and with the demand, with the, with the increasing demand for materials that to, to, uh, to offset and to help with the offset the, the residential needs on the building needs, we see a lot of the dependency on materials, and the materials uh, are directly from an from carbon uh, carbon emissions and also from operational. Uh, I, I was starting with the, some notes, and then I can see like you know the the panel uh, the, po the the poster in the back is actually helping uh, helping me with all of that. So like we have the avoid, shift, improve, and adapt, and we can start with the with uh, with the avoid as we can talking about like you know the local uh, techniques and we how we can actually use the passive systems in the design to help make sure that we actually lower the, the use of materials and also that by dependency, also the energy consumption of that. And then shifting by, uh, by using alternative building materials, uh, looking at the local, uh, the panel before us, uh, uh, our colleague from, uh, from Kenya was talking about uh, green architecture and then it, it's not a new thing, it existed before. And so uh, a, a bit of going back to how we used to design, how we used to build, uh, without having the luxury of relying on mechanical systems to actually offset that uh, that needs that we need uh, to give us the comfort conditions. Uh, just to trying to go back and learn from how we used to do it and then modernize it and rely on the new technologies that can help us to actually achieve more. Um, so in a simple uh, in a simple way, like uh, a part of our study, we were we had a couple of. Uh, uh, case studies in different locations, and we had one in Africa and one in India. And um, looking at some of these techniques, like the double roofing, and some, uh, that can actually help us with at least 10 to 20 percent, uh, reducing the energy, the operational energy cost, uh, in a couple of examples. Using local materials, uh, like um, uh, relying on carbon, uh, like sorry, coconut panels, like you know, in, in Ghana, this can help us with another 10 percent, not only from an energy perspective, from our analysis, but you can see also that it has other benefits like reducing humidity that by definition also help us uh, uh, as well. So, uh, so it's kind of, a, it's an ecosystem and we need to consider all of them. So starting from the design, making sure that we design with less as, as Anna presented earlier, uh, and also looking at the design techniques, um, uh, working with the environment, 
how we can actually design how we used to design before and using utilizing the, the local materials that by definition will also reduce the transportation needs. Um, and then going back to like you know the, the avoid shift now it's improved decarbonization uh, like conventional materials so like the new technologies the new materials as you mentioned there were a, a couple of uh, examples presented in the in the conference today so we can go and and check them out and we try to actually make them more available uh, a big part of the challenge you, it goes back to working with local people convincing them that, that we can we can also trust the environment trust the design work with that um, uh, and that and will and make make money out of that, right? Uh, oh, exactly. Make exactly. money out of waste. It's good building all these ecosystems that actually live off and work with them instead of like relying on imported materials or imported designs, even as we were doing. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and again, you have a few examples of what Mohammed was just mentioning of uh, insulating materials out of uh, agricultural waste as well. We move on now to Germany. Uh, Dirk, of course, the, the situation in Germany is, is, is very different than, than, than in Egypt, um, where 50% of the housing is informal still. But Germany has other type of challenges. You must uh, build still quite a lot and refurbish and also build new. Um, in the current situation that we have in Europe, where we are trying to save wherever we can and we must keep this trend in the future, how are you making compatible the needs for, for comfort and, and, uh, and um, affordable housing with not exploding our climate targets? Yeah, I would like to start saying that in Germany, actually, we have been making many progresses at the energy front, so decarbonization, at the housing and living, uh, living sector, much less. No? And we have mu much less progress in the sector we are talking about. And I would like to mention four um, leverage points or recommendation lines, very aligned with what Anna, you said, uh, presenting your results for our German context. We are currently having a plan to build 400,000 new living spaces annually. So the question is how to drive this towards climate neutrality, right? And the four leverage points which we are discussing with our ministry in this regard are the following. The first one is building as many as possible new living spaces for people within the existing building stock. No? This is about remodeling, converting, prolonging the, uh, the life cycle of buildings. This brings down uh, material flows and energy consumption, obviously. No? So this is number one. This is a shift in perspective, a radical shift in perspective, because modern is to build new buildings. No? But we need to build within the building stock. So this is number one. Number two is a field where, where Germany has been making progress, energy standards for houses. No? So energy standards for heating and cooling. And we have developed in our agency respective standards and pathways. And this is working relatively well because we have experience on that. When in the past people looked at buildings and urban development and decarbonization, the only thing they had in mind is energy efficiency. So we are good in energy efficiency and making progress in this regard. No? Number three is what you, you all talked about, which is very challenging also in Germany. This is building materials. Because also in Germany, 30 to 50 percent of the, the, f the greenhouse gas footprint of our buildings, 30 to 50 percent is gray energy. So this is the building materials. And we need a building materials revolution or transition, therefore. Three leverage points which uh, we are discussing, nature-based solutions, and are completely in line with what you have been saying. We call this biogenetic biogenetic materials, no? a lo lot of room for improvement because we are not using those. Innovation needed, research needed. So this is element number one. Element number two, you also mentioned this, and I on only need to, to, to highlight it again, decarbonization of existing building materials. So this is concrete and steel and cement and all what you talked about. And we know the technologies in this field. We know how to do this. We are not doing that. No? And the third element is then, in this field of materials, new materials. We have a colleague here in, in our room. We discussed this several times. So new materials for buildings. No? So these are our leverage points when it come to, comes to building materials. And circularity is, of course, the way to do it. But we are also in Germany, I would say, in whole Europe, in a linear economy when it comes to buildings. In Germany, we are recycling 2% of our building materials. 50% of our waste and 50% of our material flows in Germany are construction and building. We are recycling 2%, nothing. No? So 
Now moving towards circularity, this is what we are having in mind. And my last point, which is controversial, it has not been touched in the discussion until now, but in Germany it is important. I would say in richer countries it, it, it is important. I would not mention this point talking to Global South uh, colleagues. No? The point is living spaces. So living spaces per capita have been growing rapidly in all our rich countries in the OECD world, no? uh, overcompensating the energy efficiency gains which we have been realizing, rebound. No? So talking about shrinking step by step living spaces is our fourth element. And as you can imagine, it's the most difficult one. Yeah, the beautiful tiny houses. <laughs> but we see beautiful examples, for example, in the Netherlands. But yeah, we need a cultural shift also. Abso absolutely. And now we go one step forward beyond circularity and we move into regeneration. And I would like to turn to Philip. At the Bauhaus Heard, you are developing this concept of regenerative built environment. Could you please, in uh, a short intervention, because we are running out of time, explain what it is? Yeah, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. And let me <coughs> start by saying how much I enjoyed this session and, um, and the rich contributions from everybody. So <coughs> I'm going to just add one more maybe layer complexity uh, to what has been said <clears throat> beyond talking about uh, building and the need for reducing, avoiding, shifting, improving building practices in relation to carbon uh, consumption. Um, we believe that there is actually um, the possibility uh, using biogenic materials to uh, actively store carbon, um, but, but to think about it in a scale that could actually make buildings and the built environment and building practices um, an active, um, give them a, an active role in climate restoration. So how could that work? Um, for that, we need this systemic perspective again. We need to think about where building materials come from, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, land use changes we may need to think about, uh, because this is where um, sequestration uh, offers a unique nature-based solution to carbon uh, capturing from the atmosphere. So if we radically um, expand, think about land use changes to expand, um, um, think about forestation, think about other kind of biogenic materials um, in agroforestry sectors, et cetera, um, we, we need to think about um, um, uh, land use changes and um, urban practice changes um, in tandem. So this is what we mean by sort of a regenerative built environment, um, uh, thinking, of course, that has been stressed in the session um, about substituting carbon rich construction materials with uh, circular bio based materials, um, such as timber, bamboo, etc, um, to reduce um, emissions, but also to store carbon dioxide withdrawn from the atmosphere, turning buildings and cities into carbon sinks, which would then only work, of course, if we um, combine um, the change in building practices with active afforestation. So thinking about the sustainable management of bio-based materials combined with the regeneration of urban and regional landscapes, afforestation, reforestation, investment in urban green infrastructures to actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And then lastly, and this is another, this is the social dimension of a regenerative built environment to think about integrated urban and spatial planning tools to ensure socially just climate adapted, livable and resource efficient urban and infrastructure development. Um, and this, I think if you think about the potential of the built environment, the potential of building um, as um, a force for good, rather than thinking about it in, in relation to avoidance um, and shifting and, uh, and reducing, I think we have the kind of positive story, not positivist, but the story I think we need to really bring societies with us uh, and, make, uh, and um, get everybody behind us uh, for the change that we advocate. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Um, yeah, we need to change our mindset into a no harm policy is not, not good enough. We need to start fix what we did wrong and we did wrong things for the climate for the environment but for the people as well right because sometimes our way of uh, producing the materials we use the way we construct our buildings go through exploitation of people and i would like now to invite sharon uh, from the grace farms foundation 
to explain to us what is it the situation with forced labor in the building material supply chain and what do we need to see to, to, uh, to change this reality soon. Your mic is off. Yes, thank you. So thank you, Naomi, and also Professor Dyson. Um, to complete the full picture of the life cycle of building materials, we're also considering embodied labor or embodied suffering. So forced labor is currently subsidizing the opaque and the complex global material supply chain, yet this issue remains remarkably unrecognized worldwide. So the building materials, including sustainable innovations, comprise approximately 45% of the cost of a construction project, yet they are generally not inspected, traced, or documented for fair labor wages. So we initialized a movement designed for freedom to create this radical paradigm shift to first illuminate and create institutional responses and then remove forced labor from our building material supply chain. Nearly 28 million around the world are in forced labor conditions, working in hazardous and inhumane environments, millions who make and extract building materials that go into our buildings. And as noted, the built environment is the largest single contributor to climate change, but it's also the largest industrialized sector at the highest risk of modern slavery. So while we're starting to inspect our building material supply chain for embodied carbon, we're not inspecting for embodied suffering or the force and labor, um, you know, forced labor that harvests, mines, refines, processes, transports, and manufactures are building materials that arrive at the job site. So practices that run counter to the natural environment and prioritize consumption and low cost production are the exact same practices that fuel the injustices of forced labor. So in other words, you can think about like this, there's an inverse relationship between driving costs lower with speed and increasing human cost. And as we aim to um, you know, meet the demand of green technologies, we need to under, better understand who benefits and who bears the cost of the energy transition and avoid harm to local people and environments at the source. And even the large scale renewable projects like solar, solar panels that include polysilicon at very high risk, copper and aluminum have significant supply chain challenges, but also a um, high degree of forced labor exposure. And one example in terms of mineral, the Center for Social Responsibility and Mining Sustainable Materials Institute estimates in order to meet the upcoming demand of copper, mining projects will likely be centered in climate sensitive locations. So 65% of undeveloped copper reserves and resources are located in close proximity to biodiversity cons conservation areas and 45% in close proximity to indigenous people's land. And then when you think about minimizing the risk of embodied suffering, it can be achieved in parallel to the movement to minimize embodied carbon. We have a toolkit that notes the relevant sustainable certifications and standards that also include third-party audit uh, for labor and does affirm that material circularity truncates the material supply chain at the extraction level with the highest degree of and risk of forced labor. So as we noted, the reality is that most material cycles continue to be rather, you know, rather linear than circular. And then what um, Anna also noted that recycling is a powerful yet vastly underutilized decarbonization tool for glass, particularly in the building sector, and the future use of flat glass in buildings is expected to grow, both from renovation and new construction. And think about this, there's no currently no certifications that include fair labor assessments in glass. That's just what, you know, we have 12 materials that actually comprise the at-risk materials that we're speaking to and concrete timber certainly are, you know, they're all fraught. Um, now that just to, to, to wrap it up, the, there are other um, cross sections. Um, the climate change is forcing mass migration as crops, water sources and farming opportunities continue to suffer and dwindle. And as we note in our report, a migrant workforce is at the top as of, in terms of key risk factors for modern slavery. 
And then again, raw material suppliers are expected to be at higher risk because of the demand uh, supply chain, um, you know, uh, imbalance. And so if, um, and also like you were describing Philip too, this is a time to initialize transparency to assess both embodied carbon and now embodied suffering that will actually help to drive humanitarian impact. That's a rare, we have a rare opportunity to do so in a very weighty marketplace. So lastly, we can, and we must investigate the labor embedded in our building materials, prioritize local earth-based materials and move from linear to circular material cycles to create market transformation and end embodied and embedded suffering are our dependence on forced labor in our building materials. Thank you, Sharon, and um, thank you very much. Uh, since really we have here in our beautiful walls uh, a lot of data and information about adaptation, mitigation, green jobs, but it's true that um, you know, doing no harm in the, the people who are behind and, uh, and um, invisible, uh, it's not uh, very much at the front scene and this must change, I hope, uh, by COP28 next year in, in the Middle East. And now before we go, because we need to, to leave the room for the next event, I would like to ask every one of the speakers for a last intervention under one minute, please. I know that's challenging, but what would you like to see in COP28 next year when we meet with freshly out of the press, global status report from the global ABC, what wouldn't you like to see again on that report? What would you s think we need to see by next year in November as, okay, at least here we made progress. And then I can go back and uh, have a good glass of wine or, or juices of, or anything. I'll start with Naomi. Great, thank you. Um, I think we really need policies and incentives. They're crucial to stimulate market demand so that reusable and secondary materials are accepted and to really incentivize the creation of, you know, conventionally local, um, conveniently located CRD uh, reuse centers so that, you know, that we can concentrate materials for secondary materials in kind of one stop shop that can really, really enhance circularity and make it more commonplace. Thank you very much, Naomi, from that. Myling. Yep, um, I think one of the things we, we talked about, which is key, is that we need to see both this supply push, financing and investment into the development of our bio-based enterprises, um, as well as that market pull, investing into new models of building demand and desire for low carbon housing, especially for low to middle income uh, groups. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Philip. Well, pushing in the same direction, I think we need not only academic studies, but we need actually investment in demonstrators that put experiments on the ground where people can touch it, see it, respond to it, and actually um, also begin to believe that it is possible in their reality to switch to building materials and circular practices. And Sharon, what would you like to see at COP28 being less of an issue as today? I, I, I would say the, fir the first thing is to recognize um, embodied suffering alongside and in, in tandem to embody carbon and recognize that ethical material transparency is a means to, a, uh, to decarbonizing as well our future and a more humane future. Thank you for that. Dirk? I would like to add a factor which we have not been discussing, which I'm not seeing either here in the room, and this is the element of aesthetics of buildings, because I think that beyond all the technical aspects which we have been uh, discussing, which are very important to get people on board, the nice thing here is that we can relate all of what we have been discussing with the beauty of buildings, and this is related to well-being of people and might mobilize our citizens to move into this, this direction. Yeah, make green buildings more desirable. Mohammed. Um, I think uh, most of the comments that were put, uh, I, th I would second again the point about data. And we need to have access to data, and also policymakers need to have access to data. And hopefully, we have more and more uh, studies and also data from the ground that can help us actually analyze and be able to push for more uh, better solutions. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you to all of our speakers in this panel, but also thank you to the presenters. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, Anna, Leon. Thank you very much to the colleagues who made possible this event from GIZ and the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in Germany. Thank you to everyone who, uh, all the people who are watching online, those who are here, let's continue the conversation around uh, a coffee outside and enjoy the rest of your day at COP27. Thank you very much. Thank you.